Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on the philosophy of Jordan Peterson. This second video on Maps of Meaning, I will resume the discussion by covering the first half of Chapter 2. Now, you may recall that I already did the first video on Chapter 1 of this book about a year and a half ago, and I apologize for taking so long to resume the discussion, but as you may know if you have your own copy of this book, the second chapter is very long and also very dense. I think a lot of people who um, only knew Jordan Peterson from his uh, controversial YouTube videos on political issues, um, were actually quite surprised to see just how dense and technical Maps of Meaning is, and just how rigorous a thinker Peterson himself is. And this definitely is an outstanding book, one of the best of the uh, past few decades. I'd recommend you check it out if you can, although about a year ago I think they were going for like $80 a copy on Amazon. But if you find this discussion uh, interesting, you might want to consider checking out my upcoming book, The Philosophy of Jordan Peterson examining his books, his uh, YouTube discussions, his thoughts on politics, philosophy, etc. should be available hopefully within just a few months as early as December of the present year 2020 for less than $10 paperback, less than $4 Kindle edition. So we'll go ahead and have a very quick review of chapter one um, just in order to make the following discussion make as much sense as possible. And um, in the first chapter, he argued that we usually think of the world as just one thing, but it's actually something which can be construed in two different ways. So we usually think as rationalists in modernity that the world is, well, it's a place of things. It's a set of scientific essences uh, described objectively through the scientific method. And that is true. The world is that, but it can also be construed as a form for action. And it's actually more the default stance for us to treat it as a context for behavioral action. And you can see the difference between these modes of construal by comparing the way that the sun had traditionally been construed as an anthropomorphic um, mythical deity like um, Ra in ancient Egypt, for example, and only very recently came to be construed as the solar body known to modern astronomers as such. Misunderstandings arise, however, from confusing one mode of construal for the other. It's not that only one of them is the right way to do things. Both are perfectly legitimate, though they are different. Mythology is not a failed attempt to do science, nor is science a correct version of mythology. And yet, the, the two are also not exactly even in the sense that the scientific method is always secondary to our more primordial narratological stance of being in the world on a mythological level, for the simple reason that one of the basic psychological requirements to be able to function in a real world filled with dangers is that you have to have some sort of map of meaning to transform chaos into order. This map is, however, mythological rather than scientific because it's a story determining how you will move from an obviously unsatisfactory present state to a super idealized future state. Piling up scientific facts will not be enough to accomplish that. And this is the subject of maps of meaning. So, um, although Peterson has become more famous in recent years for his critiques of SJW politics, few people have a proper appreciation for the theoretical reasons why he adopts such controversial stances. And I think that the best way to understand Peterson is just in contrast with Anita Sarkeesian of Feminist Frequency, the most stereotypical of all power leaked hive mind leftists. Critics of traditional social hierarchical structures, like Sarkeesian, tend to assume that these forms are all so arbitrary that anyone could transform them at will into something considered more up to date by the ever, change, ever changing standards of political correctness. All they have to do is have the willpower to do so. Um, as early as her Little Red 2010 MA thesis at York University, Anita Sarkeesian blamed misogynist portrayals of women in video games and television shows on a tendency to recycle outdated archetypes inherited all the way back from myth, uh, from Greek mythology, like the damsel in distress, um, uh, without realizing that these can and should be updated, even though she admits not knowing exactly how. Uh, the problem in her MA thesis was that even if you attempt to have empowered women within um, video games like Laura Croft or within television like uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it's still not really feminine because you simply borrow 
morphological traits from the archetype of the masculine hero. Laura Croft solves uh, disputes with violence, and she has a very stoic attitude while doing so. Well, that's not really good enough for Sarkeesian. You have to intentionally push the limits of these archetypes in order to force them to progress into something entirely new. And because she really is a Marxist um, in that she says herself in her 2010 MA thesis that she's not interested in negating just one corporation, but all of capitalism, the entire capitalist order, um, on the gamble that the magical power of negation will automatically birth something better. Her later, more widely known critique of tropes versus women in video games made the same argument, but to a much wider audience who were actually correct to interpret her emphasis on negativity as a threat to gaming as they knew it. That was kind of the entire point, was to scrap it and get something better. Of course, Anita Sarkeesian's critique of everything wrong with the world as filtered through her Twitter account has also favored a, an approach of abstract negation on the gamble that you'll get something better. For example, the tweet from the beginning of the great lockdown of 2020, where she said, why hasn't America frozen rents and mortgages? Why hasn't America nationalized its health services? Why hasn't America released everyone in prison? Why hasn't America issued a shelter in place for the whole nation? Now is a great time to read up on alternatives to capitalism. In other words, negate the way we do, thing we do things now, and you'll automatically get something better. Well, somebody actually tried that in the uh, state of Colorado, an inmate jailed on child abuse convictions released because of coronavirus concerns was quickly accused of strangling a woman and fracturing her arm in the process and was then on the run all over again. Somehow, negation isn't really good enough in the real world. But a thinker no less great than Zizek, obviously Peterson's most um, uh, famous rival, basically argues the same thing as Sarkeesian. He celebrates negation for its own sake by arguing that the proper interpretation of Hegelian dialectic is the nothing negating itself and then achieving reconciliation with negation rather than restoring a new positive order. At the end of his 2012 book, uh, The Year of Dreaming Dangerously, Zizek openly argues that it is unreasonable to expect him and his fellow Marxists to provide a detailed, positive description for what the post-capitalist world will look like, because that misses the point that you'll only have the openness to evolve to that new order if you emphasize negation as such. Because Peterson is an anti-Marxist, he is noticeably more cautious with regard to forms, and he actually cites communism as an empirical confirmation for why you have to do that. With communism, Peterson reminds us, you didn't actually get rid of the social inequality and hierarchical structure which you superficially negated from the older order. All you really did with the Soviet Union was change who got to occupy the privileged hyper-minority position. You didn't actually get rid of that position. And this is just one more confirmation, Peterson claims, of the same Pareto distribution which you can find in all competitive endeavors. The distribution of um, wealth within the world, for example, follows a certain mathematical distribution in which the vast majority of outcomes are basically zero, a modest minority gets a decent return, and a hyper minority gets a huge return. You can find this in seemingly trivial uh, competitive endeavors as well, like songs played on radio stations. A, a hyper minority of songs will get a huge return. Um, a modest minority will get some airtime, and the vast majority of songs will get a return of basically zero. And Peterson warns us that the Pareto distribution is not a, an anthropological f problem related to flaws in human nature. It's actually a natural law which can be observed even in non-human contexts of competition all the way down, he claims, to the molecular level. And therefore... Form is far less fluid for Peterson than it would be for um, Sarkeesian and Zizek because treating the Pareto distribution as a natural law proves that scientific essences are independent realities to which we have to be accountable. They're not simply arbitrary pseudo-forms which we can play around with at will because it happens to be fashionable at this moment in history to do so. In fact, he noted that some of the more extreme SJWs who call science itself racist 
miss the point that mathematically formalized theoretical statements of that kind are not occurring within the kind of mode of construal which you assume um, when you make evaluations of it being good or bad at that level. That's simply a very basic error with regard to the type of thing you're dealing with. But it's not only scientific essence, which uh, is a form which you have to respect without playing games with it. Um, even our own um, psychological function requires a certain stable and meaningful mythological form, which we negate only to our own demise. Even um, the social structures, which seem totally arbitrary, like the extended family and the market economy, are things which obviously we know are not perfect, but we can say at the very least that they function, <laughs> that they work, um, even though we can't fully explain the exact reasons why. In fact, Peterson has noted that controversial as it might be to acknowledge, we actually get pleasure from literally seeing these structures. The um, experience of family hierarchy through things like a um, strong father figure are things with psychological benefits, even though um, we're being trained to, you know, feel like we have to hate these things. They're actually good because um, hierarchy is something which need not be thought of as an evil in itself. Therefore, we get back to the text uh, with chapter two, Maps of Meaning, Three Levels of Analysis. He provides a much more complete explanation for the theoretical reasons why he makes such uh, um, uh, unfashionable, I guess you can say, um, uh, statements as that. And he argues that because we exist in a real world, that is to say, you are basically an animal embedded within nature where there are many dangers. You are not an idealistic um, uh, solipsist like the, uh, I guess, the Cartesian cogito uh, existing in a vacuum. Um, the domain of the known and the unknown make up permanent constituent elements of all human experience. Regardless, there are notable differences in how humans function in the presence of the known and the unknown. The domain of the unknown is a place where more primordial emotional forces rule. Proof of this can be seen just in the way that humans' hardwired reaction to encountering anomalies in their environment overlap to a large extent with the biological responses of other animals in the same context. The known helps us deal with the unknown by providing a certain map of meaning, which is basically narratological in nature. You have an unsatisfactory present, of course, but it is understood in relation to some idealized future state. That map, of course, might be disrupted by anomalies in the real world. A small scale error, however, will only cause you to adjust the plan, but retain the same goal while a catastrophic error will force you to change the plan and the goal um, or else suffer extreme emotional dysregulation. The known and the unknown have some correlation to the two modes of operation which the brain has to, at its disposal, while the capacity for creative exploration makes up the third constituent. Archetypally speaking, chaos has been represented within mythology as feminine, Order has been represented as masculine, and the mediator between is represented by the archetype of the knight who slays the dragon in order to overcome disorder and restore order. Along the way, elements of experience sort themselves out into categories based on their valuation relative to the goal. If they help the dragon slayer, they are evaluated positively, while impediments are evaluated negatively. It bears mentioning that for Peterson, these do not make up a smooth continuum. They really are a binary in which one is either good or bad, though elements which fail to fit into either category and remain simply irrelevant do admittedly make up the vast majority of our experience of the world. In some cases, the anomaly might be so negative that it disrupts the entire story and forces the subject to adopt a whole new map. Revisiting Peterson's distinction between the two modes of control, that is to say scientific essence versus a valuation for personal narrative, he notes that the two are not created equal in all actuality. A model of narratological meaning is absolutely necessary for survival, while building up scientific models of objective reality are only ever at best useful. That's why for the vast majority of human history, for the vast majority of humans who have ever walked the earth, um, everybody basically did the former, while only a very small minority ever really did the latter. Maps of meaning require 
uh, the three elements of a current state, an ideal state, and the means of active mediation to get where you're trying to go. The end goal, however, is also valued more highly than the current state, uh, regardless of whether it is ever actually attained, um, because the idea that you're going there is a necessary illusion which you need just to function. The whole map, in fact, is affect laden only because of the perceived importance of that final ideal state. And therefore, the unknown has a priori motivational significance because it serves as an unconditional stimulus to action. This is because of the difference between empirical sensory information, which is the subject matter of science, and uh, valence. Valences are strictly bipolar and not evenly so. Whereas the best good thing might make you a little bit happier, the worst bad thing will end your life altogether. The two are uneven, even on an epistemological level. Whereas the best good thing ever is totally ambiguous. Everybody will have a different answer for what that is. We all know and can agree that the worst bad thing is death. For this reason, you have to have a fantasy image of the goal in order to determine your interpretation of the current event, event which you are experiencing now. This is why maps of meaning are always subjective. There is no single correct answer for what the ideal future should look like, or rather a hermeneutical subject has no choice except to be free enough to have to stylize his or her interpretation of that ambiguous best good thing ever in their own way. Existing in the real world therefore involves a certain infinite feedback loop in which a hermeneutical circle uh, moves from constantly comparing the witnessed event to some hypothetical future and then rendering a judgment and acting in co consequence. If an event contradicts expectation profoundly enough, it indicates that our understanding of both the present and, more importantly, the future are flawed. True catastrophe means that the map itself has to be changed for the simple reason that the future's desirability is an unquestioned given. We can only function if we know a priori that the future will be better than the present. The only question is how we will get there and what the future might be on a more specific, like subjective level. Uh, but there's no question that the future is going to be better. Likewise, whereas a um, trivial obstacle does not call into question anything beyond itself, that is to say, you um, have a roadblock trying to get to work, well, all you have to do is take a different route and then the problem is solved. A complete breakdown of one's plan as a whole shows that it is your image of the world which is an error. In other words, you have to change literally the entire world in order to keep functioning. And on a neuroscientific level, he notes that um, you can explain a lot of this um, with, by understanding how the brain has two different subsystems. The left brain is the um, realm of order uh, or of give me more details, while the right brain is the realm of global hypothesis formulation. And when you have anomaly, you really use the right brain to deal with it for that reason. The left brain, in other words, makes explicit with detail what had already been rapidly globally drawn by the right brain. We need a way to adjust our map of the world because although valences seem totally objective, that is to say everybody can agree that food is good and a blow on the head is bad, significance is not absolutely fixed. I mean, will you really work hard for more food if you're already pretty full? Although we misrecognize such valences as permanent attributes of the world, the truth is that meaning shifts precisely when goals change. And therefore, Skinner's error as a behaviorist was that although he discovered through crass experimentation that valence is context-dependent, that is to say, an animal which has been intentionally starved is going to value food quite a lot. Um, Skinner admitted that you need to have a pretty complete picture of a given organism's reinforcement history in order to accurately predict their internal state. For an animal who has been trapped in a cage and um, submitted to uh, detailed record-keeping and surveillance practices, this seems like a plausible goal. But for people in the ordinary world, that doesn't really work. You can't know a person's full reinforcement history, 
and instead have to work with an intermediary framework reference. Also, Skinner tended to assume that it was already a given whether a, a stimulus was, was good or bad. But in reality, most situations are ambivalent and require a certain hermeneutical process of thinking about the stimulus in order to determine which category it fits into. This context which is required to sort one from the other is, of course, a story. An anomaly might be serious enough to disrupt the whole story, even if it only apparently calls the end into question. This just makes sense, because if the end dissolves, the means become fully irrelevant. If I don't know where I'm going, I don't really know where I am right now either. A mistake is evidence that the plan is incomplete and has to be updated or perhaps even abandoned altogether. The existence of the unknown is therefore paradoxically an environmental constant to which every culture has had to adapt. To use Peterson's own metaphor, no matter how large the island of mapped order might be, the sea of the unknown will always border it. One might argue that one can only be a real embodied cultural being if one has some way to adjust to the unknown. As he says himself, one set of the systems that comprise the brain and mind govern activity when we are guided by our plans, when we're in the domain of the known. Another appears to operate when we face something unexpected, when we have entered the realm of the unknown. At the level of brain functioning, the hypocampal comparator constantly and unconsciously checks what is actually happening against what's supposed to happen in order to compare the interpreted outcome of active behavior with an image of the intended consequences of that behavior, because mutually contradictory emotional states will produce interpsychic conflict like nothing else, we have to rely on culturally determined beliefs in the form of shared narratives to protect, uh, protect us from unpredictability. Likewise, the point of exploration after the intrusion of disorder is not to produce a scientifically correct explanation of sense contents, but rather to map out the motivational and affective significance of things. Anxiety, therefore, is a natural category of thought. Fear, contrary to expectation, is not learned artificially. Fear is the a priori categorical position for a real subject embodied in a world with the constant presence of the unknown. True novelty, however, is not the same as arbitrary diversity. There might be a thousand different tones or a thousand different colors, etc., but experimenting with experiencing all of them is not the same as actually encountering anomaly which could disrupt one's world. An arbitrary tone really signifies nothing punishing, nothing satisfying, etc., because its context-dependent significance sort of by default maps out to zero. In contrast, exploratory anxiety in the form of restriction, expansion, transformation of behavioral repertoire, or in very rare cases, revolution or an update of the modeled reality in all three temporal senses, is um, something which, if unsuccessful, will leave the novel object entrenched in the natural anxiety-provoking category. Security, not fear, is secondary. That's what's actually learned. Early rat experiments on the subject were inherently misleading because they implied that fear was the result of punishment. Although punishments produced fear, that is true on an empirical level, it was simply a restoration of an original state of fear which the rat had already been put into after entering the disorder of the cage in the first place. In fact, rats and humans will react very similarly when thrown out of order into chaos. First, the rat slash human will freeze up. If no punishment seems to materialize, the rat will sniff and look around, and it will then proceed to move about the uh, cage, etc. This is really a, a process of mapping for valence. The question here is, first, is there anything that can kill me? That is to say, the negative valence has priority. And if that's been established as no, then you can start searching in a positive level for things like, are there any potential mates around here? The rat, in other words, is not a scientist. It doesn't know objectivity. And in this context, it really wouldn't have any use for it either. Rats and chimpanzees will actually both kill formerly familiar members who had become estrangized at the level of smell. And if you really want to understand the essence of humans, Peterson argues that the motor 
homunculus will literally show you the essence <laughs> in much the same way that in 12 Rules for Life, he claimed that looking at the large visible neurons of the lobster brain will allow you to see the essence of, um, I guess, natural categories of, of processing hierarchy through thought, etc. Um, in uh, Maps of Meaning, he argues that the motor homunculus will um, show uh, the uh, image of the little man, which sh uh, shows you the essence of humans in a more accurate representation of who we are than the naive view of the human body in its ordinary proportions. The image of the little man will show you, for example, that our face and tongue are grossly dispor disproportionate to the rest of our body. Um, and that face and hands are the parts of the body capable of complex actions and therefore have that level of uh, that uh, sort of disproportionate uh, importance uh, for that reason. The reason why the hands are so much more important is, of course, because they're capable of a much wider range of exploratory behaviors with regard to the world. This is the defining feature of being human in the first place. Dolphins have very large brains, but they don't have hands, and therefore they can't shape the world as we do. The hand also opens up a certain uh, rabbit hole for symbolic activities to emerge, such as now you can have imitation, now you can have pointing, etc. And it's something of a physical precursor to language itself. Of course, spoken language represented by the large mouth on the little man also extends taking things apart and putting them back together in a symbolic form. The overemphasis on the fine musculature of the mouth reveals a certain possibility for communication or the exchange of information among people. And this leads to a certain ability for scientific observation and experimentation. The material structure of Homo sapiens just happens to be ideal for exploration, but also for disseminating the results of doing so. In fact, thinking is it itself just exploration in abstracted form. For Peterson, the categories of thought are not a priori as they would be for Kant, nor are they metaphysical as they would be for Aristotle, uh, but they're also not totally arbitrary or artificial, as you have natural categories extending well beyond the, anthropo uh, the anthropological realm of man to be present even within the thought process of lobsters. Still, what makes human consciousness unique is its capacity to create novel categories of interpretation on its own. The brain, therefore, is something which has to be understood as containing two different emotional systems as well. The right brain gives you a threat response when confronted with the unknown, whereas the left brain um, gives you a promise response in the presence of the familiar. Each hemisphere has a family of related functions, which we will review very quickly. The left hemisphere gives you operation and explored territory, positive affection, um, uh, activation of behavior, word processing, linear thinking, detail recognition, detail generation, and fine motor action, while the right hemisphere gives you operation in unexplored territory, negative affect, inhibition of behavior, image processing, holistic thinking, pattern recognition, pattern generation, gross motor action, etc. In other words, the left brain is the side of linguistification, while the right side gives a fantasy form to the unknown through imagistic hypothesis generation. Global pattern recognition, rapid formulation of, vis of visual notions through fantastic representation, the a priori hypothesis is in all cases that the unknown is dangerous and therefore existence precedes comprehension. The right brain tells you what should be done in presence of a novel thing, which has already been determined to exist. It doesn't care what it is objectively or scientifically, because at this point, the valence being negative takes precedence over every other uh, way of understanding it. Categorization, according to valence, is therefore pre-objective categorization based on significance for behavior rather than scientific essence. You know that it's dangerous, threatening, satisfying, or promising before you know what it is on a more uh, objective level. Therefore, at this stage, one's not dealing 
At this stage, you're not dealing with an Earth, but rather with world, or really more so with the pragmatic objective of how to transform chaos into world. At this level, mimicry allows you to do things which you can't describe explicitly. That is to say, you have knowledge, even if it has not yet been linguistified into words and things like that. Um, and you, you do this through adopting observable patterns of action. For example, on an extremely simple level, if X is dangerous, you run away from it. If X is safe, you approach it. This shows on an epistemological level that how we act in the presence of things is what those things mean, even before they can be categorized more objectively or abstractly. This fits into Peterson's general view that the mode of construal, which reveals a scientific essence, is secondary to the mode of construal, which reveals significance for behavior according to positive or negative valence. Pre-abstract classification, he says, simply is knowing what to do. This proves that we always understand more than we know. And, um, of course, because um, the a enormous investment um, into understanding things on a linguistified level um, is always going to fall behind this sort of embodied knowledge, no matter how hard we try to understand why social institutions with thousands of years of history, like the extended family, or admittedly imperfect but still functional economic arrangements, like the uh, market economy we have now, um, even though we can't explain uh, why they work, we still know that they do, and we know that recklessly destroying them on a whim on the gamble that whatever follows afterwards will be better is unspeakably irresponsible. Of course, because we're embodied beings in a real world, our maps have to be modified, particularly in the process of social interaction. Um, we're hardwired really to react to uh, anomaly through fantasy. We use imaginative representation as the initial adaptation mechanism to deal with it. This is, in fact, a necessary axiomatic precondition uh, to be able to comprehend more explicitly later on. The left brain takes this, I guess, material and then goes on to make images of action patterns into increasingly detailed and logical stories, otherwise known as narratives. A story is a map of meaning because it is a description for how to act in a given circumstance, uh, not in order to objectively understand a given thing, but rather in order to ensure that the valence remains positive. In other words, the left brain's job is to finish out the story by providing the proper temporality for the segments, by ensuring internal consistency among the phases, by utilizing the power of logic as such. In contrast, the right hemisphere can alter the representational schema through creative exploration. It favors rapid pattern generation by providing the initial imagery through fantasy, which uh, is then later filled in with linguistified details um, on the other side. Once again, the left brain provides sprawling symbolic chains because of the luxury of being within familiar territory, while the right brain adjusts the big picture in response to disorder. The left brain's work also plays the properly linguistic role of providing patterns with a structure that makes them inherently communicable to other speakers. Procedural knowing how, however, always precedes and exceeds the declarative knowing what of linguistification. If you look at Piaget's stages as well, a child will use imitation to embody much more information than he or she formally understands or can communicate to others with words as such. Memory, therefore, can be broken down into procedural knowledge, which is embodied in action, and then declarative slash propositional knowledge, which is linguistified um, in the sense that the latter itself also breaks down into the subtypes of episodic knowledge of literary representation, and then semantic description, which is explicit or abstract knowledge as such. There is a um, hierarchy, however, in which procedural knowledge will exceed episodic knowledge, which will exceed semantic knowledge on a quantitative level, in which myth will play an intermediary role between action and linguistic representation as such. We learn a story which is not understood simply through watching from a third-person perspective. 
because social patterns are emergent properties of the process of social interaction itself. Wonder becomes myth because there is no such thing as a full explanation of all of this in linguistified forms. There will always be a certain excess beyond any attempt to do so. This is, however, actually a good thing because mimesis vastly expands, uh, expands our behavioral competence. And because mythological knowledge is not the same as scientific knowledge, in mythology, central features of behavior come to be understood as personified characters. Playing, however, goes beyond mere imitation because it is freed up to be less context-bound. Narrative contains more information than it explicitly presents because it further disembodies the knowledge extant latently within behavioral patterns. In fact, much of the information within a story is just a retrieval cue for the information stored within your episodic memory. Therefore, behavioral wisdom must be represented in episodic memory and portrayed in narrative before it can be accessible to conscious verbal formulation. The lower levels rights can be shared without consciousness of the structure of the right, though later that might become possible as well. And therefore, for Peterson, the developmental stages are behavioral action, then imitation, playing, ritual, drama, narrative, myth, religion, philosophy, rationality. And for he's a little bit like Hegel. If you look at Hegel also uh, positing art and then religion and then philosophy, there really is something to that. That would be interesting to explore within the book itself. Um, but for Peterson, rather than being a dialectical progression like it would be for Hegel, it's more that each stage is more generalized and more detailed and more abstract than its predecessor. Explicit consciousness of X is developed in a feedback loop of procedure, representation, abstract alteration, practice, etc., in which, interestingly, Peterson explicitly claims that defining uh, the defining epistemological accomplishment of each layer is precisely that it fleshes out the essence better while filtering out accent, uh, accident more than the last. This makes sense because the first stage of action is actually just exploration itself. Likewise, each stage takes you further from the pure particular and closer to the general type, the law, etc., through allowing essential features to overshadow particular features as such. Semantic and episodic phases, therefore, don't directly modify the procedure. They modify the world, and the world, in turn, modifies the procedure in a uh, kind of uh, interesting feedback loop. The same stimulus, by the way, might possess competing valences. In fact, if that were not the case, we would never have to do any thinking. It is precisely the ambiguity of stimuli which makes hermeneutics possible and, in fact, a necessity. This ambiguity is only resolved, however, through using a story as a frame of reference. After all, though the story is a frame of reference to determine valence, each story might have a nested or hierarchical structure only one layer of which might be occupied at a given moment. You can voluntarily change the focus by mapping larger or smaller areas of space and time at any given phase. You might also distinguish conscious stories, which contain a narrower window of expressible frame of reference with unconscious, which uh, break down into the episodic slash imagistic and procedural, or that which is manifest only in socially codified behavior as determined by a complete social interaction. Because... Higher-level stories co cover broader expanses of spatial-temporal ter uh, territory and are more complex. They are harder to linguistify. Myth, therefore, comes in to fill those gaps in a more primordial way. Therefore, Peterson's own epistemological hierarchy is that within the realm of procedural memory, um, you have imitation, playing, and ritual, and, you know, kind of in a subset, superset level, with an episodic memory, uh, you now have drama, myth, religion, and literature, and when you have a semantic memory as well, now you have philosophy, rationality, and I guess kind of like scientific empiricism as such. So that will conclude this discussion, and uh, thank you very much. I'll look forward to resuming it soon.